All right, you are in for a treat this evening. Our featured speaker is Steve Padilla, editor of the Los Angeles Times, column one, the showcase feature for storytelling at the Los Angeles Times. Steve has been at the LA Times for nearly 34 years. And before that, he worked for the San Diego Union before it merged with the Tribune. Steve covered East County, so he's familiar with our neck of the woods. And over the next uh, 60 minutes or so, Steve is going to offer practical advice on how to make your writing tighter, brighter, and more powerful. And as mentioned, if you have questions along the way, please type them in the Q&A field and we'll do our best to address them. The session is being recorded. It will be posted on the San Diego Press Club YouTube page. So make sure to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to get notified of upcoming videos on our YouTube page. All right, Steve, it is all yours. We are looking forward to this. Okay, thank you, Elise, Luis, for the kind introduction. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Um, so I need to tell you about something I saw on a television show one night. Um, I was watching that program um, where they interview actors, I think uh, inside the actor's studio. And, um, and I'm embarrassed to say that I don't remember the name of the actress, but she said something that really jumped out at me, that really influenced how I view writing and how we can grow as writers and develop as writers. And here's what she was talking about. She, um, she uh, had studied at a conservatory, I think uh, Juilliard. And she was talking about working with actors who did not have that kind of um, training, who just really went by gut and instinct. And she was just marveling at the things they were able to do. And she said, it was just astounding to watch them work. But then she said she was grateful for her training because, and this was the thing that got jumped out of me. She said, whenever I get in trouble, I can lean back on my training. Ooh, whenever I get in trouble, I can lean back on my training. And that really jumped out at me because, see, writing, like acting, is a creative enterprise, but, you know, there is technique to it. There are um, principles that we can observe, certain techniques that we can observe, and that can help us get out of trouble. Because too often, I think we're, um, we're just relying on the muse. And some days, you know, she takes the day off. So my goal tonight is to share with you some techniques you can use, some tricks you can use that will help you in any kind of writing. And you, oh, and you need to know this. What, I wanted, what I'm gonna share with you tonight isn't designed for bad writers, isn't designed for beginners. Um, it's, this is the stuff I use. This is the stuff I use every day and it works for all kinds of writing. So if there are any English teachers out there, this works for English essays as well as news stories. And if you are a journalist, this works for um, dailies that you gotta just pound out, you know, real fast, or a project. Writing is writing. Okay, so now what I'm going to give you are three big techniques and then a bunch of little things along the way. But before I give you the keys to the kingdom, I have to share just a little bit of philosophy because it's important. And this philosophy forms the foundation of everything that we're going to talk about tonight. And this is now the Alex Trebek memorial moment because it will be phrased in the form of a question. And that is, what is the most important thing in writing? I mean, pause and think about that for a second, because we don't. What is the most important thing in writing? Is it structure? Is it syntax? Is it grammar? Um, is it style? Is it the words themselves? Answer, none of the above. Thank you for playing, but none of the above. The most important thing in writing, and we blow this off, guys, all the time. The most important thing in writing is the meaning, the message, the idea, the point, that's the most important thing in writing. And I know this sounds really kind of obvious and basic, but we blow this off all the time as writers because we're writers and we want to be writerly and we want to show off and play with the language and, and do cool, clever things, right, as writers. And I know you guys, let's be honest, you all have your own favorite words that you like to put in print, right? You all have your own favorite words even though they're not appropriate, but you love that word, either because you like how it sounds or maybe how it looks on the page. Um, I have this one writer I've worked with for de decades now, and he just has a thing for the word countless. He just loves that word, countless. I think it's partly because of how it sounds. I have this other writer, I was joking with another editor about him because he has two words he particularly likes, um, vanguard and, uh, and multitude. 
And often there's a vanguard leading the multitude, by the way, in some of his stories. So we love words. And I'm going to confess here, I do this often in my talks, is admit that I have a thing for what I call the ein words, the words that end in I-N-E and that refer to animals like canine, feline, bovine, you know, corvine. That's crows, by the way. And, um, and one of the, I think, ultimate moments in my career at the Los Angeles Times was when I got the word leperine in print, by the way. Uh, that's ever pertaining to rabbits. So now this is somewhat good. I mean, we should have fun with the language, but on the other hand, we can lose control of it. And I think the thing you need to remember is always come back to whether you're trying to figure out the structure of a story, whether you're trying to figure out how to word a particular sentence, it always comes back to what's the point? What's the point I'm trying to convey? We agonize so much over how to say something, and that's appropriate. But what we should really be doing is agonizing over what we want to say. Because if you know what you want to say, you'll figure out how to say it. That's so important, I'm gonna say it again. If you know what you want to say, you'll figure out how to say it. I always like to say that good writing is uh, like pre like um, first degree murder, it's premeditated. So that's the foundation. Whenever you're in trouble, come back to what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? Now, um, I'm gonna give you three handy ways to figure out what the point is. But you know, before that, I'm gonna share one other thing. I'm gonna tell you a quick story. I need to tell you about how I learned to write descriptions. And I think what's useful here is not just what I learned, but the process, because I think you can take this process and apply it yourself for other, for the things you want to work on as writers. So here's what you need to know is I used to write terrible descriptions, just lousy descriptions, and they always got taken out. And um, they just always got taken out of the stories. And then um, I was reading a book of essays by E.B. White. Uh, I forget which one, there, there are several collections. I recommend any E.B. White, by the way, uh, if you want to learn how to write. And one thing I noticed with E.B. With, um, with e. White is he writes great descriptions, just brilliant descriptions. And I had finished reading the book and, uh, and I went back and I just started scanning, looking just for the descriptions. Because I thought he's doing something that I'm not and I got to figure out what it is. And I'm looking at them and I'm just trying to find the description, read it, log it in my head, find another one, log it. And I finally realized what he was doing. Although his descriptions are very clever and writerly as hell, fundamentally they are accurate. The key to a great description isn't cleverness, guys. The key to a great description is accuracy. And what I realized was that when I wrote descriptions, I really didn't look at the object. I sort of just glanced at it and went straight to words. And I think what E.B. White did is he let the object give him the words. Again, it always comes back to what's the point, what's the meaning. And, and one of my favorite ones he wrote about involved a, a raccoon, um, which is procyonine, by the way. And the raccoon was coming down a tree at dusk, head first, and it's coming down this tree. And down near the bottom, it turned around, put its hind legs on the earth, and then it held the tree and just was there in silhouette holding the tree. And it's a female, you need to know it's a mom. It's a, it was a female raccoon. And he wrote that they looked as, that they, he looked at them and he wrote that they looked as though the tree were her partner in the dance. Looked, looked as though the tree were her partner in the dance. Now think about that. If you're standing and you got your arms out like that, it's kind of like dancing. And if you look at a lot of the descriptions he does, they are fundamentally accurate. Okay, so one night I'm reporting a little feature story on some girls in a ballet class and they were supposed to hop together. They were in, they were kind of like in a phalanx. They were, you know, rows and files and they're supposed to just hop together. And they could not, they're like, you know, random and they're going this way, they're drifting, you know. And, and I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, don't do what you normally do, Steve. Be E.B. White for once and write a description. Let the image give you the words. I've, and I go, I've seen this, I've seen this. I'm looking at it and I'm watching the moment. And I finally wrote that they hopped with all the grace and precision of exploding popcorn. And it got in. The editor left it in for once because it worked. And the reason it worked was that it was indeed fundamentally accurate. Okay, so that's one trick for descriptions. But look at the process, because you can use the same process if you want to work on leads, 
if you want to work on transitions, if you want to work on endings, if you want to work on nut graphs, as we say in the trade. I basically realized that I had a, a problem. It sounds like a 12 stepper thing, like I'm Steve, I write bad descriptions anyway. Um, and so I recognized that I had this issue. I saw an author who did this brilliantly. I analyzed his text to try to unlock it and figure out what was he doing. And at least in my analysis, decided that he lets the image give him the words. And then I applied it. And everything has changed since then. And, and by the way, not that you need to include a description, okay? Just be aware of that not all stories require them. Uh, we don't need to do them. They should be used sparingly. But if you are, you should do it the right way. All right, so I promised you three basic tools. First tool, and you've heard this before, but it works, read your work out loud. Okay, guys, read your work out loud. You don't need to declaim it, but read your work out loud. Uh, and you know why you catch the odd phrases, you see the typos, you realize you've left a word out, all that good stuff. But here's the thing about out loudness. Can we use that as a word? Out loudosity, perhaps? That you may not be aware of. When you're grasp, when you're struggling to figure out the what, again, that's the important thing, the what. Here's a trick. Try composing out loud. Try composing out loud. Now you don't have to dictate it letter perfect. Um, but what you do, well, here's the thing is speech clarifies thought. Speech clarifies thought. And if you just say it out loud, you have to make decisions about what to include and what to leave out. When you're sitting there silently, you know, at your typewriter, at your typewriter, I can't believe I said that. When you're sitting there silently at your computer, um, I've been thinking about typewriters a lot lately. Anyway, as you're sitting there quietly, your brain is a Cuisinart, okay? And the facts are the onions and the celery and the carrots, and they're going full speed. And if you speak, if you say it out loud, you have to make decisions. And that will, that will make the, the, the what apparent to you. So try that. I guarantee it will work. All right. Second main thing you need to do, focus on your verbs. Focus on your verbs. The meaning of life is verbs. All good writing is verbs. And, the, um, and this goes to that issue that we've heard you know, many editors say, the um, you know, show the reader, don't tell the reader which I think a lot of people don't understand, frankly. Um, and, um, and so one thing I'm always looking for is the verbs, the verbs, the verbs, the verbs. And let me give you an example of how um, picking one verb that really captures an emotion can change everything. Um, I was uh, editing a, a obituary of a, of a um, I think it was a young Marine who had been killed in Iraq. And the sentence said, he told his mother he would come back someday. He told his mother he would come back someday. Perfectly fine sentence, nothing really wrong with it. It's active voice. Um, but I didn't get a lot from the word told to tell. I didn't get a tone of voice. I didn't visualize a scene from that word. And so I asked the reporter about it. And I forget if he called the mom back or if he just looked at his notes or if he just remembered the interview, but he revised the sentence. And it went from, he told his mother he would come back someday to he promised his mother he would come back someday. I don't know about you guys, but I think there's a completely different emotional component to that. And one thing that you can do to be a better writer is do what I call the verb check. Do your draft, okay? Now, when you're doing the self-editing, just look at the verbs. I once had a reporter, by the way, who I made her do that for a month. Um, I had researched, I had looked over her clips because they were fine. I mean, there was nothing really wrong with them. I mean, they were professional, you know, these stories appear on the front page of the LA Times, but they didn't have that bada bing, that pizzazz that really you can feel with good writing. And I, I was looking at her stuff and I realized that two things that she either using was, was using passive voice. We can go over that if you want. Um, or even when she was using active voice, she wasn't getting the best bang for her buck. In other words, she was not using words that reflected the, the precision of her reporting. So for example, let's consider um, describing someone moving quickly. We could say they ran. We could say they sprinted. We could say they bolted. We could say they dashed. Those aren't synonyms. Those are not the same words. Those are not the same physical actions. And I think each word suggests kind of a different mental state too. And so one thing I had her do, editors, this is a good trick, 
is I told her that she was only allowed to turn in a story after she'd made a printout and circled all the verbs. And I told her, if it's fine, don't screw with it. But see if you can turn the volume up. See if you can be more precise. And that either forces you to just be more creative or to review your notes more carefully, or it makes you a better reporter. And that you do the reporting to figure out, should we say run? Should we say sprint? Should we say dash? What does the reporting show? So the verb check is a really handy thing for you to do. And I'll tell you guys, you look, if you get, pick up any piece of writing and admire it and you admire it, look at the verbs and you'll see that they tend to be very precise, very vigorous. You don't really focus on them because the verbs literally set something else in action. Um, and, and you'll see this with, gosh, you know, New Yorker stories, LA Times, uh, Hemingway, uh, Shakespeare. Um, in, in the, one of my favorite examples is from uh, uh, Richard II, where that kind of wussy king um, uh, has that unbelievable speech. The one that begins, for God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and, sell, and tell sad stories of the death of kings. And in that speech, he says, he says, um, look guys, I'm just a beer nuts and Budweiser kind of guy. You don't have to worship me you know, as a God. And here's how he says it. I live with bread like you. I live with bread like you. Feel want, taste grief, need friends. Listen to that. Live with bread like you. Feel want, taste grief, need friends. He doesn't say, oh, how bitter is the taste of grief? He says, taste grief. Simple verbs and they're in, they all denote action. And so take a look at anything you think is well-written and you'll see that the verbs are really pretty snazzy. Okay, third trick. And then we're gonna to see if we have some questions coming in. Third trick is put the best stuff at the end of the sentence. Now, disclaimer, I know sometimes you gotta end the sentence with comma, the mayor said Thursday. Okay, fine, no one reads that anyway. But generally speaking, drive to the end of the sentence. End your sentences with gusto. Put the good stuff at the end. Don't put the boring stuff. Tuck that in the middle where everyone's gonna, no one's going to notice it. Because if you end a sentence with gusto, it flings the reader into the next sentence. And um, one example I like to give, it was written by a buddy of mine. Uh, he was uh, doing a feature story out of uh, Latin America. He was in Guyana and writing about a, 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 a road being carved through the jungle. That's a good verb, carved. And the, actually, you know, I'm gonna type this in, I tell you what, I hadn't planned on this, uh, Luis, but I'm gonna type this in the chat thing so people can see it. I'm gonna type this here, let's see. Can I do the chat? Let's see, yeah. Okay, yes. in the all messages, this is the sentence he wrote. He's describing what's going on in the, the construction of this road. And he wrote this. Oops. One second. And okay, while, you're, while you're doing that, do, Steve, while you're doing that, I do want to remind our attendees that if they do have questions as you're talking, to make sure to put them in the Q and A box, and we'll try to right. get right. And but I'm going to put this in the chat if that's okay. Sure. So I just put the first one here. Giant ant eaters cross the road at night. Okay, perfectly fine. Nothing really wrong with it. Um, but it did jump out at me because in that point of the story, it was really daytime and it was hot and insects and sweaty workers with machetes. And it kind of didn't flow because it ended with night. You know, it put the emphasis on the word night. So then I thought, what if he wrote this instead? Let me try to type this now. What if he wrote instead, at night, giant ant eaters cross the road? Okay, now we're emphasizing the road. Uh, oh, by the way, one time I did this speech and I later heard from someone that the ein word for anteater is, I had to write it down, Myrmakofgein, Myrmakofgein. I was so, so happy to learn that. Anyway, but back to our example. So giant anteaters cross the road at night. At night, giant anteaters cross the road. One more version. Let's try this. Night. Hold on. There we go. At night, the road is crossed by giant anteaters. Okay, now, you get a, like a so-so verb is crossed, but you get a giant anteater, you know, and you don't get those every day. So look at these sentences, and I'm, I'm serious about this, guys. The um, giant, and, and hear them, don't just read them, but listen to them. Giant anteaters cross the road at night. At night, giant anteaters cross the road. At night, the road is crossed by giant anteaters. Same darn words, 
But I would argue that not only do they have a different cadence, a different feel, in kind of a weird, spooky way, they almost have a different meaning. And that's because of word order. So when you're doing a story or writing anything, you know, um, do you end the sentence with the word San Diego? Or do you end it with mayor? Or do you end it with COVID-19? Um, or, or Thursday? I don't know. It depends. What's the point you're trying to make? And so one of the things that can really improve your writing is for you to be mindful of ending sentences with a bang, you know, and, and you'll find that it actually, that that will make your organization much better. It's, that solves a lot of structural issues. And ending a sentence with gusto basically creates a, a foundation that you then can build that next sentence upon. And so sometimes when I'm editing, and uh, maybe some people who are tuning in and work with me know that um, although as an editor, I'll add stuff or take things out, sometimes what I actually do is I take words and I rearrange them. That I'll discover, I'll decide, you know, this story could be more powerful if we put this word over here rather than there. And, um, and generally speaking, by the way, there's no firm rules about this, but often the stuff you don't want to end a sentence on is usually the location or the time element. Those are usually fairly boring, but you never know. Uh, it depends on the point of the sentence. So, um, uh, so Luis, do we have, um, before I get to some of this stuff, any questions so far um, from the Q&A? What do we got? Let's see here, here they come. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip while you do that. <laughs> All right, uh, Jennifer asks, has your sentence structure and story structure approach changed with online news? Uh, in print, we were initially taught to pack all the good stuff in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, no, not really. <laughs> um, I think, um, well, I guess it depends what kind of story you're writing. I mean, I think for, um, you know, uh, your standard, you know, your classic news story, you do want to put all the good stuff up top. Um, but for a lot of the, the features that I work on in column one, uh, and particularly narratives, uh, I'm actually moving stuff down. I mean, I'm the one always taking stuff and putting it down um, and um, leaving uh, cliffhangers. Uh, in fact, I'm doing that with a story I was just working on with a reporter today where there's a bad, um, there's an accident um, in a sawmill. <laughs> you can imagine in this story. And the original version had a lot of details about what happened to someone's arm. And we took most of those details and took them out of the opening and now they're further down in the piece. So um, I would say to uh, the person who asked that question, it depends what the point of your story is. I don't think there's a full rule, rule about this. Again, what is the point? Um, actually, quick thing, uh, if I may, Luis, then we'll get to the next question. Um, if we want to just look at narratives, there's two kinds. There's, there's what I call the destination narrative. You keep reading to find out the ending. You don't know where, what the ending is. You find, find out what's the destination, okay? The other kind, which I think is more common in journalism, is the journey narrative. In other words, we know the ending. We want to figure out how we got there. We already know the tornado hit the town. We know the murderer was caught. We know that the operation was successful. We know the brush fire devastated the town. But we're reading the narrative to find out why and how it happened. And when I hear people say they want to do narratives, my first thought is, which kind? Is it, again, is it the destination narrative or is it the journey narrative? And I think if you have a firm idea of which kind, um, that will help you make lots of decisions. And for the person who asked that question, that will guide you in deciding what to have high and what to have low. So I think it's a useful thing to know about narratives. Okay, what else we got? All right, well, Cheryl uh, has a suggestion or uh, she offers this up regarding your giant anteaters example. She says, uh, how about at night, the road becomes a freeway for giant anteaters? That could work too. That could work too. Although let's think about this. You know, we are in, uh, you know, in a jungle in Guyana um, so um, does that really work in that context? Maybe yes, maybe no, but yeah, that could, that could totally work. That could be fun. All right. Uh, Angela uh, says, uh, how do you know where to start a story? Do you recommend starting in media res or does it depend on the story? Oh, I'm so glad you asked this question. Okay, uh, in media res is a, is a, a term from dramaturgy um, that basically means start in the middle, okay? And Oh my God, this was the most useful advice I ever got on anecdotal leads in my life. Um, we brought a guy in um, from the TV show Law and Order. Mm -hmm. And the embarrassing thing is I can't remember his name either. Okay. I couldn't remember the actress's name. I can't remember this guy's name. And we didn't even pay him. <laughs> we, we fed him pizza. Um, 
And he, but he wrote, he had been a journalist. He was writing scripts for Law and Order. And he was asked um, by a reporter who, a reporter asked him, you know, hey, Law, and you know Law and Order, right? The TV show with the, the yes. wrong, you know, the, the junk chung sound, right? Okay. So he was asked, you know, Law and Order moves really, really fast. How do you do that? And he said, oh, it's very simple. He said, when we cut to a scene, we don't cut to the beginning, we cut to the middle. Whoa. When we cut to a scene, we don't cut to the beginning, we cut to the middle. So in other words, in Law and Order, you'll see these detectives. Okay, let's talk to the witnesses. Then you see a face in the screen. And the face says, oh, he picked up the gun and shot everybody. So you know it's a witness answering a question, but you don't see the question being asked on the screen. That's in media res, okay? And so to whoever asked that question, the answer is uh, sometimes that's very effective. And this is a way, I, I think this is really important when you're thinking about an anecdotal lead or an anecdote anywhere in your story is where do you start? You know, do you need to say the car drove up? Do you need to say that the car traveled the freeway and then pulled up to the hotel and the guest, and then the, the kids got out for the prom? Or do you just have the door pop open and the kids hop out for the prom? Um, I have saved thousands of words and thousands of column inches in the LA Times by starting in the middle of the scene. And here's the thing about this, guys, particularly for editors. Usually when you see an anecdote that's too long, I think the instinct by the editor is just cut the whole thing to take it out. And sometimes, you know, you've already trimmed as many words as you can. I mean, the sentences themselves are inherently tight. You can't go any tighter. What do you do? Start in the middle of the scene. So watch, notice this technique, guys, you know, when you're watching television, when you're watching, um, you know, movies, um, commercials, Shakespeare, going back to Shakespeare, he starts in the middle of the scene. And any time a scene starts in a Shakespeare play, they're already talking. They're already in the middle of conversation. You know, so it's a very handy technique. I would say if you can use it, great. Um, unless starting at the very mid, oh, at the very beginning enhances your meaning. So if you need to say the judge walked into the courtroom, sat down, and then picked up the gavel, okay, that's great. But maybe you, all you need to do is say he picked up the gavel and, and gaveled the, the proceedings to order. Anyway, what, what else we got here? Well, that was a very cool observation. Uh, you know, when you were describing about Law and Order, I, you, I mean, it's now when you watch Law and Order, we're all going to think about that. We're all going to be, yeah. oh, that's what Steve was talking about. Well, you know, the other thing about that, what I loved is I love that his advice was so specific, this, this screenwriter, because I'd had editors say, you know, get to the point faster, move it along, speed it up. And I always just interpreted that um, in the sense of, um, of wordiness. In other words, that my sentences had too many words and I just kept trying to you know, pare down the number of words. No one said start at a different location. So, I mean, this, it really was revelatory. And, I, and, and in fact, one thing I've tried to do as an editor is to, be, is to offer that kind of specific advice when asking people to do stuff, because I think it makes a difference. A big, big difference. But more questions. I, I see some are starting to come in. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is more of, I guess, an opinion. Uh, but I, I do want to get your thoughts on this. Uh, Cheryl says, "Passive voice drives me crazy." But I know you've said that sometimes it's okay to use passive voice. Yeah, it depends on the meaning. Uh, it depends on the meaning. Although I will say this about you know, nine times out of ten, you want active voice. Okay. Um, but it depends on what's your point. Uh, one time, by the way, uh, Luis, she's like this. It, I was at a, uh, t a talking at a conference for community college um, students, journalism students, and some kid asked, you know, about is it ever okay to use passive voice? And when I said yes, there were just gasps in the room. You know? And I said, now hold on, guys. You know, um, <laughs> mostly you want active. Actually, let me give you a quick trick, um, editors. If you have writers who are struggling with writing in active voice, or professors, teachers, here's how you cure it. Guaranteed. Um, here's what you tell your student, um, or if you're having issues yourself. When you write your draft, don't worry if it's an active or passive voice. Oh, let's review what that means, by the way. Okay, here's, an, here's a passive construction. Um, the man was eaten by the lion. The man was eaten by the lion. Active voice, the lion ate the man. Again, using our verbs, we can make it the lion devoured the man. We could make it the lion nibbled the man. We could make it the lion um, consumed the man. You know, 
four different meanings, and all we do is change one word. That's verbs. Okay, but um, what uh, what what drives us here though is is that whole that passive thing is the man was eaten by the lion. So here's what you do: write your draft and don't worry if it's active or passive. And then you can either do this on your screen in you know with a highlighting it in bold, or you can make a printout and circle them. Highlight all forms of the verb to be. Highlight all forms of the verb to be. Basically, is, was, were, being, have been. I taught my uh, nephew this, by the way, uh, while he was in college. And the kid who hated writing started writing just awesome papers. Here's what you do. Highlight all the forms of the verb to be. Now, recast the sentence, eliminating the highlighted word. OK, so hold on here. So if you wrote, the man was eaten by the lion, and you highlighted the was, and you've got to recast the sentence, eliminating the highlighted word, it's got to become the lion ate the man. Trust me, this works. And the key thing here is that you do this on the revision. Remember, the most important thing is the meaning, the idea, and that's what you want to get down on your first draft. So this is a way guaranteed, guys, to cure passive voice, unless it distorts your meaning. Maybe you do need to use a passive construction, OK? Uh, actually, let me give you an example of a so-so construction versus a strong one and how it influences meaning. Uh, this also relates to word order. This is from, uh, I'll show you where it's from. This is from the first Harry Potter book, okay? The Sorcerer's Stone. And near the end of the book, uh, there's a scene where the gamekeeper, Hagrid, gives Harry a book of wizard photographs. And I'm, I hope you've all read the books. They're actually pretty well written, you know. And remember, he's an orphan. He's never seen his parents, okay? And, um, and remember that wizard photographs move, right? Okay, that's the gimmick. So she describes Harry opening the book of photographs. And there's this sentence. Smiling and waving at him from every page were his mother and father. Smiling and waving at him from every page were his mother and father. And when you read that, you're just ready to burst into tears. It is really moving. And why? Because it ends with the words mother and father. What if she'd written, his mother and father smiled and waved at him from every page? Doesn't work, does it? Because it ends with the word page and who cares about pages? You know, unless you're like into topography or something like that, you know. Um, but ending that sentence with the words mother and father, that's what makes that work. Even though the verb is heh, but, it, but in exchange we get mother and father. So anyway, uh, let's go to more questions. All right. All right. So just to clarify, you said there are some occasions where you can use passive voice. When is that okay? Um, I don't, well, I think it depends on, um, let's put it this way, to have to act active voice, you have to have a clear chain of command. You need to know the lion ate the man versus the polar bear ate the man or, you know, whatever ate the man. So you need to know, you need to have certain precision. And sometimes as we're still reporting stories, things are unclear. Um, we can't say the policeman shot the robber. We just know that someone was shot and we can say, you know, uh, so, you know uh, so-and-so was shot because maybe we don't know where the shot came from. Uh, we don't know if the shot was fired by the gunman or if it was fired by the police, you know? So sometimes there would be instances where you'd wanna use a passive construction. I think mainly when you're not sure of what's going on, you know, or if a passive construction would put the emphasis on a particular idea object, person, or thing that you really want to hammer home with the reader. That's my sense. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, so you said, you know, uh, hold back sometimes uh, and save the most uh, powerful um, part till the end. How does this work uh, with don't bury the lead? Well, you want something interesting, you know, uh, up top. Um, uh, let's put it this way. You, uh, how much do you want? To, I guess it's, it's, maybe it's not a question of whether you let the cat out of the bag. It's maybe it's a question of how much of the cat, you know? So for example, um, we had a story, um, I worked on a story once where there's, um, that involved a, a, it was a profile of a guy, a, a chef of all things actually, and it involved a murder. And very high in the story, um, we made mention of the word, we, we talked about his life and all these difficulties and how he had this mentor who really helped him. And I forget the exact sentence, but it was something along the line, you know, she was there for him, you know, during school and when the restaurant opened and during the, and after the murder. It just didn't say who was killed or when they were killed, 
but we've now planted that seed, you know. And so sometimes you can let people know that something's coming up. Um, so we let the cat a little out of the bag with that one. We said there was a murder and the tension was, well, who and when and how and why, you know. Um, and just because you've let the cat out of the bag doesn't mean there's no tension. I mean, think about literature. Um, Gabriel, Gar Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you know, was a journalist and a lot of his novels are kind of inverted pyramid. I mean, uh, <clears throat> But he, hell, in one novel, he lets the cat out of the bag in the, in the title, Chronicle of a Death Foretold. You know, we know someone's going to get it, um, but we keep reading. Yeah. Um, the, the very first sentence of his, uh, you know, his masterwork, 100 Years of Solitude, says something like, years later, let's see if I get it. I'm, I think I'm going to screw this up a word or two, but it's something like this. Years later, as he faced the firing squad, Aurelio, Aureliano Buendia, um, remembered the distant day his father took him to discover ice. But the opening lines are years later when he faced the firing squad. So <laughs> kind of know what's going to happen to him, right. you know, but we keep reading. Um, so I think the, um, I hope I'm answering the question for this person, um, you know, but you know, one thing this is, this is when you need to talk to your editor. Okay, this is when you need to have a discussion with your editor about, so there's no surprises. Um, in fact, I did this, I don't know if you guys saw a terrific story that we ran a month and a half ago, Brittany Mejia, um, who's been a column one machine in the last 12 months. Um, and it was about this uh, um, Zubia, I think was the family name, Zubia family, uh, five adults living in a crowded apartment in South LA uh, and the father, Jose, caught COVID-19 and died. Um, and the, the kids all got infected and they, um, desperately tried to keep dad safe, but they're in a one room apartment. And no matter how much they tried to, you know, distance themselves and keep the windows open and masks and stuff, he got it and he died. Okay, so the editor for that story, Cindy Chang, uh, sent me a draft and she said, I'm wondering about when we say Jose dies. And as I read the story about maybe a third into it, there was just a single sentence that said he had died. And um, the point of the story, by the way, was the difficulty of people living in confined spaces and dealing with the, the coronavirus. And she asked my opinion and I said, you know, I think, you're, I think your instincts are right. Don't, don't say he died, don't give it away. Don't give it away. Because there was already tons of compelling information, fascinating information in this story. It was enough to pull you in. And so we just, uh, the, we just deleted that sentence and then later when Jose dies in the piece, it's truly shocking to people and enhances the sadness um, tremendously. Um, so there we kept it a complete surprise, but notice the process. We talked about it, okay? And, we, uh, and you need to do that, folks. You need to do that with your editors. Kick it around, you know? Um, only good things can result, really. Okay, another question, then I wanna sh make a, share something with you. Uh, sure. Uh, what's your advice for writers who are told they're backing into the story? Um, well, you, you, well, first of all, you might be. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's put it this way. Um, well, if you are backing into the story, why? What is your purpose? Um, is there a way to maybe get to the point sooner or to reveal, as I mentioned, um, a, a smidgen of what's happened? Um, Let's put it this way. Backing into the story is, um, it depends what you mean by that. Uh, if you're describing like the weather and um, what, the, what the lawn looked like and describing the house, yeah, that's probably backing into it. But if you have people doing things, uh, people in motion, in movement, that probably will gather, probably get me, you know. But there is a basic thing, you know, Luis, um, uh, in terms of writer instruction, what John McPhee calls uh, uh, the, the nine construction is in the number nine. And what he means by that is you have, he starts with an anecdote in the past, and then he, he starts with an anecdote, let's say that's maybe, let, let's, let's use this analogy. Let's say your story is the alphabet, you know, and you start at L just to get their attention. You start at L and then you go back to A, B, C, D, and then you take us on through. So in other words, it's, it, it, he uses the analogy of a nine and you start like middle of the story and then you go back in time and then you use chronological order to take you through. And uh, this is a standard writing technique you see in column one, you see in the New Yorker, you see it all over the place. Um, 
you see it in movies, you see it in TV, you see it um, uh, in, in folk song. It's a classic device. And one, one I always like to cite is from, uh, from Texas. Um, in fact, are, I forget, Luis, are you from Texas? Is this a, a Tejano thing? Uh, no, actually I'm from San Francisco. <laughs> San Francisco, okay, why not have Texas? Anyway, it's an old folk song. You probably haven't heard in eons. <clears throat> And, uh, and I'm going to subject you to the opening. As I walked out in the streets of Laredo, as I walked out in Laredo one day, I spied a young cowboy all wrapped in white linen, wrapped in white linen as cold as the clay. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to sing the whole thing. Um, my next number will be Il Mil Tesoro from Don Giovanni. Uh, now, OK, so Luis, watch. As I walked out in the streets of Laredo, where? As I walked out in Laredo one day, when? I spied a young cowboy all wrapped in white linen. Who? Wrapped in white linen, as cold as the clay. What? It's a lead. Then the second stanza is a nut graph. Quote, I see by your outfit that you are a cowboy. The cowboy then said, as I boldly walked by, come sit down beside me and hear my sad story. I was shot in the breast and I know I must die. Okay, folks, we know he was shot. We know he's gonna die. We don't know why he was shot, okay? But come sit down beside me and hear my sad story. I always like to say that this was uh, clear, it was that this song was not written by a police reporter because it would have said, I was shot in the torso and I know I must die because they just love that word, the police reporters, they love torso. Anyway, after that stanza, what does it do? It goes back in time and uses God-given chronological order. Twas once in the saddle I used to go dashing. Once in the saddle I used to go gay. First to the dram house, then to the card house. Got shot in the breast. I'm dying today. So we know he was out screwing around and stuff, getting in trouble. He gets shot. And then they have a funeral. Gets, then he has a request. Get six jolly maidens to carry my coffin. Get six Get six jolly cowboys to carry my coffin. Get six pretty maidens to carry my pall. Put bunches of roses all over my coffin, roses to deaden the clods as they fall. Roses to deaden, what a verb. Roses to deaden the clods as they fall. Then there's a death scene in this song. Did you know that? Quote, go fetch me a cup, a cup of cold water to cool my parched lips, the cowboy then said. Before I returned, the spirit had left him and gone to its maker. The cowboy was dead. Dialogue, dialogue. Great technique for fiction and nonfiction. Dialogue, guys. Then there's a death scene. We beat the drum slowly and played the fife lowly and bitterly wept as we bore him along. For we all loved our comrades so brave, young, and handsome. We all loved the cowboy, although he'd done wrong. And then what happens next? In the folk tradition, they echo the lead. As I walked out in the streets of Laredo, as I walked out in Laredo one day, I spied a young cowboy all wrapped in white linen, wrapped in white linen, as cold as the clay. You've written stories like this, okay? You've, whether it's for TV or for print, you've constructed stories just like this song. I bet all you have who are viewing tonight. And it's a tried and true uh, way of storytelling. And the other thing here, guys, is, um, you know, the way we grow, the way we build our technique is to steal. And I mean that in a nice way, no, no plagiarism here, but, um, like looking at law and order and understanding how they do things, hearing a folk song and realizing, oh, I could use that, you know, reading a Harry Potter sentence and, you know, and, you know, oh my God, look what she did there. You know, she ends with mother and father and that's why that's so good. Let me show you something. I'm going to reach over here. Okay. This is a book I read last year. Terrific book. Rick Atkinson is a hell of a writer, has this particular uh, gift for description. Okay, there's a piece of paper here, see there? The reason that paper is there is it marks the page with one paragraph that is so unbelievably beautiful that I have to go revisit it now and then because he uses a device I've not used and I've got to steal it someday. I've got to use it, but I need to revisit it now and then. And that's why it's marked in this book. And so if I can do that, guys, you know, if I can take the garment and look for the stitching you know, try to figure out how it's put together. You can too. Okay, another question. All right. Uh, Steve, you got a great voice. I don't think people would mind if you would have uh, sang the whole song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
but we only have 10 minutes left. Uh, okay. So let's oh, yeah. see here. Uh, Tom asks, uh, do you lean toward shorter, simpler sentences or longer, more complex ones? Um, I don't lean towards either. I think it's what's the point. I mean, um, I think a good, what I, you, actually what you do want is a mixture. I think if you have too many short ones, it gets choppy. If you have too many long ones, it gets long-winded. Um, I think ideally you wanna mix it up. One thing is guys, um, uh, believe it or not, believe, despite what I did earlier, I actually am a musician. <laughs> And I like to think of, of writing in musical terms. Uh, it's all contrast. Long, short, loud, soft, um, staccato, legato. Staccato is dip, 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 dip. legato is smooth, you know, smooth or pointy. Um, major, minor, happy, sad. That's music, that's writing. So no, I don't lean towards one or the other. I think the issue is what is the point you're trying to make? We had a story recently, God, I wish I had it here. Um, we had an obituary of a poet um, and um, and a buddy of mine wrote it at the paper and it had a long sentence. I mean, I wish I had counted the words. I mean, it just went on forever and it totally worked. It totally worked. Um, I actually admired the long sentence because I really don't do them that well. But I would to, anyway, to ask that, whoever has asked the question, I would say, uh, mix it up. Um, let the meaning guide you. And if a long sentence calls for it, go for it. But you probably wanna follow that real long one with something mid-length or maybe short. Mix okay. it up. All right. Okay, what else we got? Oh, all right. Well, along those lines, uh, how do you decide on what the meaning of your story is? Should you keep asking yourself, so what, until you can answer that question? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. No. Um, but here's how you do it, guys. Um, I think when you're struggling for the, for the what, it's usually the product of, of two things. Um, first, you haven't, if, for at least for journalists, you haven't done enough reporting. Or if you're of a student trying to write a term paper, you really didn't read the book. You know, um, you don't have enough material, and you're grasping for words not because you don't handle words well; it's because you don't have ideas. You know, clear writing is clear thinking. Uh, I saw someone tweet one time something that what did they say? They said that um, clear writing is like clear thinking, and I thought that person is so wrong. It's not like clear thinking; it is clear thinking, and you can only do that if you have enough material. So. Um, if you're having trouble, it may be that you haven't done enough reporting or you need to review the material you have. The other uh, reason this happens, and this is more typical in, in, in um, the more typical thing that I deal with at the LA Times, because the reporters are pretty damn awesome, uh, is they've got an, ab an abundance of material. They've got so much good stuff, they can't see the forest for the trees. And that's where I come in or their editor to talk, kick it around. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, Today, I had a conversation with another editor. He asked me to look at a draft of a piece and we spent most of the time just trying to kick around, what's the point? Because it's got tons of great stuff in it. Um, and we kind of narrowed it down and he agreed that we're gonna just get rid of this and we're gonna focus on that. And he's gonna ask the reporter to ask some additional questions to flesh out this other idea. And we're just gonna jettison some other stuff, even though it's good stuff. You know? Oh, that's the thing, by the way, reporters. This is classic. Someone wants to use something because it was hard to get, and they did a great reporting job, you know, getting that material, and therefore it becomes more important. Uh, don't do that, you know. Or, you know, frankly, since the web is, you know, since we got all the space, write a sidebar, do a second story just on that one uh, thing, but you don't have to stuff it into the into the story you're working on at the moment. So, okay, uh, what else we got? Quick question about uh, op eds. Um... Oh. So uh, let's see, uh, uh, Anthony writes, I'm an African-American writer and I have an op-ed for your page at the Times. It's about the uh, Chauvin verdict and how America demands a spectacle from black death. Will you take a look at it? So who, who would you recommend that goes to? Uh, Anthony, just real quick at the San Diego Union Tribune, and I'll put this in the uh, chat box, that would be okay. Laura Castaneda. Uh, but at, uh, what do you recommend for that? Um, you know, well, since I'm in the news side, I really don't deal with the opinion folks, but I, uh, the, the editor of our opinion, uh, Terry Tang, T-A-N-G, she just joined us maybe six months ago or so, um, I believe is, is her name. And she's the one who takes those pitches. Okay. All right. So I, I can't help you. I'm on the news side, you know, so. Um, All right. Uh, Sylvia Mendoza. Uh, Sylvia says, hi, Steve. We studied journalism together at SC so long ago. Yes. Knowing what you know today, what would you tell your 20-year-old self about this career path? Hmm. Um, hmm. 
Well, I'd say still do it. I mean, I know everyone talks about how it's, you know, that things are awful in the business and it's a terrible time to get in a terrible time to get in journalism. But I was told that when I graduated from USC. So I think if you have the passion for it, uh, go for it. I think the, the one thing I wish I had known earlier was this, to, to circle back to the main theme of tonight, is had a better appreciation for technique of not relying on the muse of, of like the musician knowing, you know, knowing your scales. And if you know your scales, you can play Beethoven, you can play Boogie Woogie. You know, they're the same notes, just a different order. Um, and so I think really uh, hammering the notion of technique and, and uh, you know, watching how others do things and then learning your uh, own. Um, one thing I want to quickly mention, I'll do this real fast, is um, to challenge you guys. Um, you know, one classic thing in journalism is to end a story with a quote. I dare you end it in your voice, just to see if you can. If you want to stretch yourself as reporters and writers, end in your voice. It's, a, it's an interesting challenge. And, uh, and it'll make you grow. And I wish I had learned that um, a lot earlier than, uh, than I did. Uh, but it's a, a really, and, and it, what, what I mean by that, you, 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 you generally can end in action, you know? Um, and, um, and I can uh, share an example or two if people wanna DM me or something like that. But it's a, it's a great challenge to try to end in your voice. I dare you, especially particularly a feature story, end in your voice, not a quote. And, and can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by that? Steve. Oh, okay, well, I'll give you a quick example. Um, so John Gliona did a, a feature story about the night, here's a, here's a job, the night watchman at Alcatraz Island, okay? On Alcatraz, you know, the, the former federal prison in San, San Francisco Bay, the, 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 the park crew go back to the city, tourists leave, and one guy stays the night there on the island patrolling. What a job. So we did a story about this guy and we had, a, John was there and a photographer and they recorded the whole thing. And in the morning, there was a scene, the sun is up, uh, uh, the, the, the boat shows up from the city and he hops in the boat and he said something like, well, I'm always happy when the sun comes up, something like that. It was just a really boring quote. And so I told John, you know, no offense to these fine federal employees, you know, but um, I think you're more eloquent than the night watchman of Alcatraz Island, you know, and in your voice, and then I asked John, I said, by the way, was it still um, drizzly and cold? Because the night before it had been typical San Francisco, you know, wet, foggy, you know, that kind of thing. And he said, no, the sun was out. And I'm like, John, the sun's out in San Francisco Bay and we're not saying so, you know? So I told him, look, your new orders end in your voice and, uh, and, and bring and put in the sun, okay? And so the new sentence was, um, let me see if I could say it correctly. I jotted it down here. Oh, yeah. And remember, they call uh, Alcatraz the rock, right? right? That's what it's known as. So this was the new, so again, the first original last paragraph was, quote, well, I'm always happy when the sun comes up. Gone. The new ending was, by dawn, the night watchman is weary of the rock. Passing the keys to a ranger, he makes his own escape from Alcatraz, the sun on his face. You saw it, didn't you? He makes his own escape from Alcatraz, the sun on his face. Now, what I love about this is it's action. It's not, but, it, but, you know, it's, but it's just the sun shining. It's not a car chase. It's not guys running up and down the stairs. You know, it's not there's someone throwing something. It's the sun on his, it's just the sun shining. And yet you can see it. Passing the keys to a ranger, he makes his own escape from Alcatraz, the sun on his face. That's what I mean by ending in your voice, showing the reader. That's, a, that's one very effective technique. That's great. All right, uh, gosh, okay, we still have a lot of questions uh, and we're running out of time. We'll see how many we can get through real quick. Um, okay. uh, let's see, um, uh, you, you handle a lot of complicated uh, subjects. Uh, do you have tips or suggestions for writing about complicated topics like basic science that require extensive explanation to a lay audience? I get bogged down in the explanation and can't keep the story moving. According to Chris. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would uh, wonder um, if you have a, uh, if you're describing a process that say that says uh, ten steps. Do you really need to say all ten? Okay. For starters, do you need to say every you know step, or can you just say step one and go to step ten? <laughs> you know, um, I would be wary uh, for doing that kind of thing. I'd be wary of using jargon. I think that can be um, kind of cool and sometimes actually amusing to throw in technical words, um, but sometimes you wanna uh, simplify. Um, I think this is the kind of stuff where you really wanna work with a fellow staffer. If it's that technical, 
have them read it or read it out loud to them. Read it to your editor, read it to, a, to a, uh, your writing buddy. We'll talk about that in a second, writing buddies. Um, have someone read it back to you or have them read it back to you. Um, but I would, I think in general, ask yourself, if I'm describing something technical, is the important thing the result or is the important thing the process to get there? Because you could always say something like, in a complicated process involving 27 separate steps, the scientists essentially created a blah, blah, blah. Okay, I just simplified there. Um, now, maybe you don't wanna go that simple, but you could signal to the reader, hey, it's really bleep and complicated and there are lots and lots of steps and I'm not gonna share them all with you. Hmm. Or if you really feel you need to do that, simplify in the story and write a sidebar and say, this is how it works. And then maybe you do it by bullets. Do it in, in a separate location entirely. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully that answers Stacy's question as well. Uh, let's see, Bonnie uh, says, if you're editing for concision, uh, what are the first things you look to cut? Um, well, let me, I, I don't know if there's any, well, well look, it's hard to say, but I can tell you how to cut. Or how, I don't like to say the word how to cut. I like to say the, how to squeeze. A few quick tricks. This is, and this is, it's good that you guys are recording this because this is going to be the lightning round. Okay, <laughs> for starters, uh, you know, um, when you look at, look at your quotes, and then read the sentence directly above it. You'd be, just, just, you'd be surprised how often we summarize the quote before we actually use the quote. And that lead in sentence can often be cut in half, cut by a third, or maybe deleted if the quote's that good. So just look for the quotes, then raise your eyes, find the sentence before it. Do a, a review of verbs. Passive voice, uh, if you turn something from passive to active, it shrinks the sentence by one third. There are studies that show that. The other thing is, Review all the prepositions. Just look for the ofs, the wins, the ifs, the fors. You take out an of, you often take one or two other words with it, maybe even three. Here's another trick. Change the margins. And by that, change the width of your screen. So if you've been working on the story and you're looking at it like this, make it like that. Just by changing the look, it, you find words that looked okay like this suddenly look expendable like that. Read a printout, again, changing the, the, the platform, looking at it on paper makes it look different and you start trimming things, uh, squeezing things. Um, another one I haven't tried, but a buddy of mine swears by, he changes the font. Uh, he likes to change the font and he says it just makes him see it in a different way, see it fresh. I know someone else who changes the color and that makes him see it fresh. So these are all techniques you can use to, um, to squeeze copy. And, and then going back to our, our discussion of anecdotes, Maybe uh, you start in the middle of the scene versus the beginning of the scene, and that saves two paragraphs right there. Okay, okay. So those are uh, all methods for, for trimming, for squeezing. Okay, I, I don't know if uh, this applies to your um, columns, but what advice do you have for writing cliffhangers or teases? Oh, goodness. Um, I don't know if I really have advice for that. Um, I think that's one, you know, um, that's where I really do listen. Uh, I, I get, hmm, how do I explain to answer that one? Um, well, first of all, ask yourself, is it justified? You know, do you do a tease? Do you do a cliffhanger? And maybe the answer is no, we shouldn't have a cliffhanger. I mean, so if, let's go back to the fundamental question of is this appropriate or not? Okay. Um, and you have to decide that on your own. Um, I think for, for example, if you're going to withhold it, if you're going to, when you, when you're wrestling with, do I reveal someone died? Going back to that story I was telling you about, about Brittany, well, how does that affect the story? If we hold something back, does that mean, if we hold back the death, does that mean we have to hide other material that's really relevant to the story? Will we be hiding too much? Um, if we hide it uh, till later, does that enhance the story or does that just confuse people? Uh, so I think it always comes back to what's the point? What's the meaning um, on whether to do that or not? Um, but as far as learning, how to write them and to appreciate the technique, that's where I'd really pay attention to what you hear on radio and TV and promos. Uh, you know, the folks who do broadcast really are masters uh, of, of that, you know, really in many ways. Right. Learn from them. Right. Well, uh, this is the part I hate because we are, uh, we're over on time. So uh, we have to kind of start wrapping it up. Uh, and I'm glad you kind of went full circle here about what's the meaning uh, right back to where we started. But is there anything else you'd like to add, Steve, before we go? Yeah, uh, real fast. I want to give people three challenges. 
Okay, first challenge. I want you to take the Steve Padilla 30 word challenge. Take the Steve Padilla 30 word challenge. And what I mean by that is when you think your story's done, now not like a little six incher, okay? I mean, story. When you think your story's done before you file, cut 30 words. Not 50, not 100, not 200. I mean, that's, that's really chopping. Trim 30 words. Just do this as a regular technique. And you'd be surprised how that just trains you to find those extraneous phrases, words, whatever, to improve the verbs. And it tightens the drum head. And then the, then the, the, the drum roll is all that snappier because of it. Um, and to show I practice what I preach, a few years ago, I was doing a freelance story, Luis, for this um, magazine about a, a profile of a, of a teacher. And, um, and I was getting paid a dollar a word. It cost me $30. You know, I, I lost 30 bucks on that deal because I, I felt I had to prove, uh, you know, prove my point. Um, the other thing I did, and this is my second challenge for y'all, is I ended that story without a quote. Because I know, since I preach this so much, that if I ended it with a quote, I was going to get so much razzing and so much you know, nonsense, I, I, I couldn't do it. So I came up with one. So I, but seriously, the other second, so first of all, 30 word challenge. Second one, in a feature story, try to end in your voice. You'll see it forces you to be more creative, forces you to be a better reporter, forces you to think of the ending earlier in your story. In fact, that's a very good technique. While you're writing begin, your beginning, think of your ending, not the words. That'll just screw you up. The idea, have the rough idea. And then when you have that, it makes the decisions, the beginning and the middle easier. It gives you like a North Star to navigate to. Okay, last challenge. Get yourself, every one of you, get yourself a writing buddy. And hear what I mean by that. Yeah, you can, you know, tune into, you know, seminars like this. And thank you, uh, San Diego Press Club, for inviting me. I'm really tickled that you asked me to come back in a way to San Diego, you know. And you can do these seminars, you can read books, you can follow me on Twitter. I only tweet about writing, guys. I don't tweet about my cat. I should, he's magnificent, but I only tweet about writing. But what you can do is get a writing buddy, get a friend who you can send a story to and say, hey, did you see this lead? Did you see this description? You know, or they send it to you and you guys get together and you just talk about writing. You know, I do that with my writing buddies. I probably have too many writing buddies actually, but go get yourself a writing buddy. And Luis, what I would just say is if you, and, and the other thing is always remember that these techniques are not for beginners. They're, this is my tool chest. These are what I do, you know, and let the meaning control your word. Don't let your words control your meaning. And if you do this stuff, guys, you're going to find that your, your writing will have a certain uh, muscularity. I would call that taurine, you know, like a bull. Uh, and it would be kind of sleek, like a lion. That would be a leonine, right? You know? And, um, and I'll tell you this, folks, it'll increase the odds that you don't write anything asinine. Okay? So uh, I think that's it, unless uh, there's anything else, man. All right, well, Steve, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to thank you for being so nice and so helpful. Uh, when I went to work at the LA Times uh, three years ago uh, to launch LA Times Today, uh, you, I have to say you were one of the most helpful people there and I, low, oh, thank you. I, I owe a lot of the success of the show to you. So thank you for that. I'll never forget uh, all your help. And, uh, you know, I, I'm glad we're, we're still able to, to stay in touch. Uh, if you want to follow Steve, uh, he, point, he always uh, tweets uh, writing tips and you can follow him at Steve Padilla too, which I put in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, Steve Padilla, editor of Los Angeles Times, column one feature. And thank you to everyone who joined us here tonight. Let me turn it over to uh, my fellow board member, Rick Griffin. Steve, thank you once again. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Steve. I will never think again for the rest of my days about uh, in the same way about giant anteaters. Thank and you. <laughs> and exploding popcorn and um, the uh, streets of Laredo. Uh, so thank you. It, it was a great time. And uh, I got tons of uh, tips to um, use with my students and, uh, and myself, certainly. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thank you for uh, your support of the Press Club. Uh, join if you're not a member. Thanks again, uh, Steve and Luis. And um, I'll turn it back over to uh, Terry Williams, the executive director of the Press Club, who uh, will... Um, kind of close it down, but uh, 
Have a great uh, uh, Thursday, Tuesday night, <laughs> Tuesday night, everybody. Well, great. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks very, very much for joining us. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Thanks, Luis. Thanks, for everybody. Thanks for everybody for joining us. Thanks for very much, everybody, for joining us. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs>